And I looked up and over my left shoulder, pretty interested by the fact that I have some sort of human-esque form. I looked up and over my left shoulder and I said, literally with a lilt in my voice, I said, and who are you? And the answer was immediate. The answer was, you're the image and likeness. I'm the original. My guest today is Rosemary Thornton, who is an author and a near-death experience survivor. Uh, Rosemary, welcome, and thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I'd like to start with some background of what your life was growing up, if we could, and then can you tell us about your near-death experience? Yeah, growing up stuff was a bore. The fun stuff started later in life. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you say you, a lot of people do this, but they talk about near death. And I've been a writer for, I guess, 30 years, and I call it my temporary death experience. Near death is if you're on an airplane and it's careening toward the ground and things are going badly. And at the last minute, there's a, a wonderful heroic save and it all turns out well. <laughs> That's a near death. Yeah. I would, and, and it's true for most people who've had the so-called NDEs. I died and got to come back. But yeah, growing up, I grew up, you know, typical person in, in the United States, I guess, baby boomer and, uh, you know, had a very, very thoughtful artistic mom and a not so thoughtful dad. And, you know, that's life. I talk about that. And, you know, it's really interesting on other podcasts I've done because I've done a lot of podcasts. Yeah. One of the most common comments I get is uh, is people talking about my father the, the comment I made that my dad was not really a kind man. I get a lot of email about that. It's very interesting. Apparently, that's not an uncommon experience. It's a generational thing, isn't it? It's like one one father wasn't great and he, that didn't teach that yeah. son how to be a great father and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I've, I've written a bunch of books. Well, not a bunch. I've written 10 books. I, I'd written nine and then I had this NDE, I guess we'll call it, and uh, several people asked me, was I going to write a book about it? And I said, oh, no, <laughs> heck no. I've written nine. I think it was Dorothy Parker who said, I hate writing. I love having written. And I, I identify with that very, very clearly. Writing is hard. Yeah. I didn't want to write a book. And plus, it's very private. You know, I'm, I'm actually a really private person. My other books were on architectural history. It's easy to write about old houses. <laughs> But writing about, you know, kind of a memoir of your life and, you know, finding what you thought was the love of his, of your life. And then that ended very badly. And then getting sick and going to heaven and getting, as my friend Dale says, I got evicted from heaven. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty personal stuff. But you did anyway. So um, there's a couple I of things anyway. there I, I, I wanted to to tease out. If you don't mind talking about, it, so there was something about about your husband and uh, your life together, and then something after that as well. I didn't quite catch what it was, but I feel like there was there was something there yeah. was. I'm, I was trying to read between the lines there. Could you tell us more about that? Well, I guess the big point of the story is that uh, I met him. Uh, he was my second husband, actually, and I met him in my early forties, and I just couldn't believe that. I had found somebody as wonderful as him. He was handsome, educated, successful, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then after about 10 years of marriage, he, uh, he ended his life one day, which uh, there was no warning, no, no expectation that that's how it was going to end. In fact, we were planning to buy a retirement home in a nearby community and, you know, live out the rest of our days there. So uh, that was devastating. To call that devastating is an understatement. And one of my chief gripes, and I'm not going to go too far down the proverbial rabbit hole here, but we talk a lot about suicide prevention these days. And I think that's unfair to people like me who've survived the suicide of a loved one, especially on social media. People say, if you're feeling sad, just reach out. Well, you know, he was my husband. And there's lots and lots of people who in their own lives that don't reach out. They don't want to reach out. They just do the thing they're going to do. And it doesn't mean it's a, a moral failure on their loved one's part, they, that they couldn't discern it. They couldn't figure it out. So that's, uh, I think it's September is Suicide Awareness Month or something But in, in the U.S. But I just really find that very unfair. Anyway, 
suicide prevention is kind of a misnomer. And I, I, get, I hope it helps a few people. I kind of think that if you're young, it might help you more than if you're a you know, man approaching retirement age or somebody who's settled in life. So I don't know. But that was very, <laughs> call it hard, was an understatement. But yeah, it was, it was uh, I'm a sensitive soul. I'm a writer. And it devastated me. And for 29 months, I just circled the drain, kind of waited to die. You know, I had a financial advisor take me aside and said, where do you see yourself in two years? And this was after his death. And I didn't miss a beat and said almost immediately, oh, I'll be dead by then. Because mm -hmm. I had no expectation I'd survive this. I was so sad all the time. And I talk a lot about the fact that in that time period, I had three prayers because my life was a mess. The bank started foreclosing on my house, my marital home that I had with him. So I had to sell it in a hurry. Uh, I couldn't find a place to be. I couldn't find a way to get comfortable anywhere. Uh, so yeah, things were very hard then. And then I said three prayers every night. One was, I asked God, heal me or let me go. I knew I couldn't continue on in that state. And secondly, my prayer was no more hard decisions. I had had to make so many difficult decisions after his death, and they were painful, complicated. You know, when a spouse dies, there's a lot of stuff that has to be tidied up. But when a spouse dies by suicide, there's even more stuff that has to be uh, dealt with. And in my case, as is so typical, and a lot of people don't realize this, people compare a spousal death, an ordinary, what one might call an, uh, a natural death, to suicide, and there's no comparison. Uh, suicide widows like me, we get questioned by the police because we become mm. the prime suspect in a murder investigation. And that's kind of the last thing anyone needs to go through. So there was a lot of legal messes. So one of my prayers was no more hard decisions. And then the third prayer was I had always been a big fan of NDEs and had read so many of them, so many of the accounts, so many individual stories, so many books, et cetera. And one of my prayers was when I pass on, I don't want a life review. I had been through this mess once. I didn't want to see how I crumpled into a sad little mess after his death. So those were my three prayers. Heal me or let me go. No more hard decisions. And uh, spare me the life review. Did you feel in any way responsible for what happened with your husband? I think everyone goes through that. Mm. And one of the stories I shared in my book that meant a lot to me, I was actually in another state when this happened. And I had to fly home immediately, and I was a mess. I mean, I got a phone call. Hey, we found him. Mm. You know, it was a very, very bad way to get the news. Probably could have been handled better than that, but, you know, everyone was in shock. So I ended up on a, actually a, a southwest plane headed from a northeastern state to the south where I lived at the time. And... uh they had one seat left on that plane. It was Southwest, so they don't have assigned seating. And I ended up seated next to this guy that kind of a rough looking cat. He had tattoos all over him. He had his hair in a braid and he was wearing a leather vest. And uh, But as I sat down next to him, he looked at me and he said, uh, are you okay? And I said, not really. And I told him what had happened. And he said, for somebody who's just found out that their husband died by their own hand, he said, you're doing really well. And he said, whatever happens through the rest of this experience, I want you to remember that God and the angels are looking out for you because he said, my mother did the same thing. She called me one day, there was a terrible argument, and then she ended her life. Hmm. And I thought, wow, what, just from a very practical standpoint, what are the odds that I end up seated next to a guy who's been through that? Which is, by the way, for anyone surviving the suicide of a close loved one, that's very common to have an argument. It's like that extra angst or upset gives them an edge to do this horrible thing. So uh, that's not uncommon at all. And yet it does leave you with a lot of guilt. You know, wow, yeah. if, I, if I had not had that argument, would he still be alive? And then in time, so many of the people who loved me would say things like, you know, this, this isn't your fault. But then somebody explained to me in a way that stuck with me. They said, there's nothing you could have done to prevent him from doing this. And there's nothing you could have done to push him into doing this. You just didn't have that much power in his life. And that was immensely comforting. Mm. Uh, so that, that was greatly helpful. 
And, you know, I, I've often said that suicide survivors, which is what we're known as, are the 21st century lepers. We scare people. And that's not just true of suicide. That's also true of um, anyone who loses a loved one through a terrible tragedy. We frighten people. You mm -hmm. know, I, when, when I had the visitation for his funeral and, you know, the long line of people are coming up to offer their condolences and hopefully say things that are a comfort. Lots and lots of people, I can't say lots, a handful of people would come up to me and say, I don't know what I'd do if anything happened to my Bobby. I think I'd just lay down and die. Not helpful. Hmm. Not helpful. Because the inference is that I didn't love as much as they loved. And if only I'd loved a little more, I'd probably be dead because I couldn't love without him. So it's it's pretty messed up. And, you know, people say, so what do you say? What you say is you 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 say, I love you. I'm sorry you're going through this. I can bring you a casserole on Tuesday. You know, people say, what can I do? Don't say, what can I do? Say, can I show up Monday afternoon and take the dog for a walk? Can I show up Wednesday and cut the cat's toenails? I mean, offer practical things that are hard to do. That's the best way to go at it. And sometimes just say, you know, I, I'm cooking a big meal Thursday night. Why don't I bring some over to your house for you? Because, again, it's so typical of people who survive this. Uh, you lose the ability or interest in food. I lost about, I don't know, 30 or 35 pounds because I just couldn't physically eat. So it's pretty rough. So when I was um, 29 months out from this, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, you know, when do I get a break? When does the bad stuff stop Good. happening? When do I get a break on this? And and yet that's when um, that's when I had the near death experience. It was a surgical thing gone wrong. They nicked something. Oopsie! <laughs> I ended up they ended up sending me home even though I was bleeding a lot. And then they uh, they said, "Oh, you'll be fine once you get home and sit down." I wish I knew the stats, and I don't remember the stats anymore. But women are too likely to die from heart attacks. And the reason is when we go to the hospital or we present at the ER and we say, I'm having terrible chest pain. I feel like I can't get enough air. They go, oh, it's a panic attack. It's anxiety. Go home and take a Valium. You'll be fine. <laughs> and they go home and die. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I did tell the nurse I was bleeding out. They were like, nah, once you get home, lie down, you'll be fine. Right as rain. Just go back to your own little bed and lay on your pillow. You'll be a-okay. So I did what I was told. I went home and I realized I was not a okay, and I realized I was bleeding out pretty bad. I I've told this story before, but I had really really pretty carpet in my house. I had this really almost white carpet, and so you know when you're bleeding to death, your number one concern is not messing up the carpet in the living room. So I was pretty worried about that carpet. Okay. So I went and stood in the bathroom because I knew if I bled on the tile, it wouldn't be hard to clean. And uh, I realized I was bleeding to death. And, you know, I had thought a lot. There's a Bible verse, Corinthians 10, 13. I think it's 1 Corinthians, where it says, uh, God will not tempt you beyond what you are able, but God will show you the way out. And I heard that years ago, and I thought, this is my way out. I have been given a get-out-of-jail-free card with this bleeding business. <laughs> I really figured that was the deal. God had heard my prayers. I could die now. And... uh but then I also thought, you know, through this whole process, a lot of people had worked so hard to keep me alive. And I thought, is it really fair now to just die on them? So I was taken by ambulance to a hospital and they made some more mistakes there and managed to <laughs> grease the skids to the afterlife for me and send me on to my reward. <laughs> you know, one of the stories I share is they gave me, so I'm bleeding out and I have lost a tremendous amount of blood. Tremendous. Was there actually blood exiting your body? Like you, you could see that you were bleeding. Yes. Was it? it was a yeah, gynecological okay. yeah. biopsy. Yeah. So right. it was a lady parts okay. thing. And, you know, yep. so, yeah, I mean, there was, it, it was messy. Let's leave it there. It was really yep. messy. Okay. And uh, <laughs> so at the hospital, they, uh, they gave me a, a shot of a morphine derivative, which, you know, if your blood pressure is going down, that's, that's like, here you go, honey, let's get you to heaven a little faster. Oh. And it, uh, my blood pressure, my friend, I had a friend that came with me. I talk about him in my book and sat beside me. So they gave me this shot of, uh, of a morphine, uh, drug, morphine derivative, actually. And the doctor and the nurse 
go out into the hallway like, yeah, she'll be fine. <laughs> so my friend stayed with me. And, he's, and he said, I passed out pretty quick. I passed out because I'm almost dead. And they give me a shot at this morphine stuff. And then uh, he said at one point, he looked at the blood pressure cuff and it said uh, 32 over 25, which is pretty much dead. Oh. And he said at that point, I, uh, I tried to sit up on the gurney, which is pretty darn impressive. And I reached my hands up like I was, you know, ready for somebody to pick me up. And he said, my friend, the witness said, you talk to somebody that only you could see. And he said, and after that, I flopped back down. And uh, that's when I went to heaven. And it was great. You know, I don't remember that reaching up stuff. I don't remember that at all. But I do remember I had been in a deep, dreamless state at the time of my death. And I popped out of that body like toast out of a toaster. It was very, very dramatic. And having been a fan of NDEs, I knew exactly what was happening. I knew I was dead. And floating away from my body, I was floating away in this blackness. And floating away from my body, I thought, this is great. I'm out. And I, I remember thinking one of my first thoughts was, it really did feel like I'd been granted uh, early release for good behavior. I mean, <laughs> I was pretty done with Earth at this point. And because I was supposed to start chemo and radiation in the next week. And I thought, hmm, that's no longer a concern, is it? <laughs> and one of the things that I take great comfort in, and I'm told other people find comforting, is I remembered all that stuff. I remember the firemen who came to the door to put me on a gurney and hustle me off to a hospital. I remember the friends who had shown me so much love and so much kindness. I remembered that I had some bills due and I was no longer worried about them. <laughs> and I remember thinking, that is not my problem anymore either. <laughs> uh, I remembered so much of my life in this earthly experience. And one of the first things that happened was I thought, is I'm floating away in this perfect, velvety, comforting, and comfortable blackness. And I remember thinking, my heart has stopped. And I thought, how do I know that? And I thought, I don't know how I know that, but I know that's right. And then my, is, you know, again, still drifting, floating, very peaceful, gentle, floating away from my body. And then I thought, oh, you're dying. And then I thought, actually, you're not dying. You're dead. Because when you're going on to your reward, the most important thing is correcting your tense. <laughs> and it cracked me up. And I thought it was so funny. I laughed out loud because, you know, I cracked myself up a lot, <laughs> talked to myself a lot. And that was also immensely comforting because I remember thinking, I don't think I'm, I know I don't have breath sounds. And I don't know that I have vocal cords or lungs or the traditional accoutrements that you use to produce voice and sounds, not to mention hearing. And yet I can hear and I hear my own giggle. And that was so comforting to know that even my funny little giggle went with me. It was immensely comforting. And then another thing that happened very early on is while I'm still floating, I mean, this floating... I don't know if it went on for 20 seconds or 20 minutes or who can define such things in another realm. But at one point I felt that I was joined by a massive, and I mean massive spiritual being, and she was to my left and much taller than me and very tender. I, I wasn't afraid. I was comforted by this presence, very comforted. And I hadn't even thought about the fact that it seemed like I was alone until this presence joined me. And I looked up. And over my left shoulder, pretty interested by the fact that I have some sort of human-esque form. I looked up and over my left shoulder and I said, literally with a lilt in my voice, I said, and who are you? And the answer was immediate. The answer was, you're the image and likeness. I'm the original. Oh, wow. That's First Genesis 26 and 27, I think. And I thought, how cool is that? There's an original. And I'm, but the image and likeness. So it was so cool. And this whole thing just went on and on and on. And I remember this peace I experienced. A lot of people talk about the love they feel when they have a, an NDE. And in my experience, I would say the most pronounced feeling that I had was one of peace, a deep peace. Because I had had the love of a good mother 
but I had never, I had always been very prone to anxiety and upset and worry and strife and blah, blah, blah. But this piece was almost mystical. And I remember thinking, I always wondered what I would look like with the absence of anxiety and worry and angst and fears and woes. And I thought, I like this. I like who I am without all those fears. And I thought, this is great. <laughs> this is really great. And I did think about the fact, I felt like so much of what makes me unique had gone with me in this transition. Because you always wonder, you know, what, what do we take with us and what leaves, what do we leave behind? And I thought about the fact that what went with me was this peace and this deep settled calm and joy, so much joy. I was so happy. You know, my whole life I've kept a daily gratitude list of five things for which I'm grateful. And I kept thinking, I'm so grateful it's over. I'm so grateful to be leaving this place. I'm so grateful. <laughs> I was, I really was very, very grateful. And, and I thought, what did I leave behind? And I left behind regret, the guilt, the worry, the woe, and all the negative emotions. That did not come with me. And this experience, as I said, it just went on and on. And then at some point, I was no longer floating, and I don't remember the transition, but I was on my own two feet, which is also pretty interesting because I wish I'd looked to see what they looked like, and I didn't. But I was on my two feet, and I was in a white room. And in this white room, there was this mist falling all around me, and it was uh, almost like a pea soup fog. But the room was very, <clears throat> very white. It had white walls and white ceiling and white floor and white everything. And through the mist or the fog, I saw a door in front of me, maybe, I don't know, 15 to 20 feet in front of me. And I remember thinking, oh, I, I know what that door is. That door is where I exit. That door is where I go on. And I don't come back to earth. That door is the, the line of demarcation, the boundary where I cross over to the to heaven. And I pretty much felt like, okay, clear path, doing a door. <laughs> and as I walked toward that door, an angelic being, different from the first one, but an angelic being talked to me. And the angelic being told me, and I don't remember precisely the means in which this was communicated, but the angelic being told me that if I agreed to earth, I'd be restored to wholeness. And she didn't say, healed of this nasty disease process, or the horrible grief will be gone. It was just restored to wholeness. And that was like, okay, that's fine. But I'm going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I have zero interest, man. Because you know, the other thing I thought about, no kidding, I thought, I thought it was kind of funny that I had pretty much nothing to do with doctors. And here, this was my first interaction with the medical world, and they killed me. <laughs> my first surgery, my first pretty much of anything, and I was dead. And I remember thinking there was a certain irony in this, that here I am dead. And I also remember thinking, won't, every be, won't everyone be surprised at how this turned out? <laughs> I was surprised. <laughs> I knew everyone else would be too. So as I approached the door, I did ask. I mean, I actually put my right hand up to push through the door. I was a little miffed because the door was shut. I thought the door should be open, you know, but the door was shut. But I put my right hand up to push through the door. Pretty interested by the fact, right-handed on earth, right-handed in heaven. I thought, huh, well, something else came with me. It's right-handedness. I mean, it's just so cool that who we are does make this transition. And as I did this, I paused and I asked the angelic being or the spiritual being that was with me. Quite bluntly, I just said, is this the divine will for my life that a medical mistake takes me out? And I couldn't even get past, is this the divine? I only got those words out. And the answer was seemingly to me telepathic. The answer was like infused. It wasn't, here are some words to answer that question. It was like, boom, here, here is everything. But the answer was, no, this is not the divine will for your life. But whatever you decide, if you decide to go back or you decide to go forward, you go with all of God's grace and mercy and love and kindness and care. And that was a pretty specific answer to that prayer of, I can't handle any more hard decisions. Because God was saying, actually, the, the, speci the specific infer inference was either way, 
you'll be richly blessed. And the thing I, I can't explain is that when you're in that place, all you really want to do is glorify God. And that's why I paused to ask the question. I just wanted to do what God wanted me to do. I didn't want to step off the path of the plan of God's will for my life. And so that was a big deal. So then I thought, okay, if either way it's good, I'm leaving. I'm so out of here. I'm so done with this. And then uh, I was given a vision of this nurse that had been so motherly to me. While I was still on that gurney, on that little uh, in that little cubicle in that ER, things weren't looking good. And I remember I grabbed this nurse's hand. She was an RN as the doctor was attending to me. And this was before I passed out, before I got the morphine. I grabbed her hand and I said, promise me you're not going to let me die. Because one thing I've read about bleeding to death is the brain consumes, I think it's 70% of the oxygen. The brain is a big energy user. And when people bleed to death, one of the symptoms is anxiety and kind of a panic because you can't reason. Things aren't working like they ought to be working. Mm. So that nurse had taken my hand. I was crying, lying on a gurney crying. And she took my hand and she said, oh, honey, we're not going to let you die. We have many solutions for this. And I thought, okay. She sounds like she knows what she's talking about. But then as I'm at this door in this heavenly place, and I I think, okay, if, if either way I'm richly blessed, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'll take that deal. I'm so out of this place. But then that's when I was given a vision of the same nurse. And in this vision, she was sitting in a hospital su supply room surrounded by linens and other medical supplies and such. She was sitting in the middle of this small hospital supply room, leaning forward on a small metal stool, head in her hands and sobbing uncontrollably. And I heard her say through tears, I promised that woman I wasn't going to lose her, and I let her die. And it was almost like I was an invisible witness to this thing. To say it was a vision is not strong enough. It was, I believe I was being shown a potential future. And in this potential future, I was being shown the pain that my death would cause this nurse. Because a lot of people say, oh, well, did you tell her that after you got back? Well, she, they were busy in that little cubicle trying to resuscitate me. They were busy trying to get my heart going again. They weren't off in a room crying. Um, so I saw this nurse in this vision. Again, it was like being a silent witness to her sadness. And I turned to the spiritual being and I said, you know, she's about my age. Surely she's lost patience before she'll get over this. But I need to go. I don't want to go back to this earthly experience. The grief occasioned by my husband's suicide was torturous. The grief, the loss of friends, losing my marital home to what well, started out as a foreclosure process, it just was too much, too much for any human to bear and ever want to go back. So uh, then I thought, okay, we settled that. I want to go. But then I was shown a different thing. I didn't just see that nurse sobbing. I felt her pain in my, I guess, in my center of my being, the very core of my being. And it was a wave of grief, that, uh, that deep grief that just, just destroys you emotionally. And I remember thinking, oh, I remember thinking, if I can spare one person that much grief and emotional agony, I guess I need to go back. And I put my right hand back down by my side, and I was like, oh. <laughs> I guess I got to do this. <laughs> and in a millisecond, I was back in that body. There was no whoosh. There was no going backwards through a tunnel. There was none of that. I was just back in that body. And when I opened my eyes, I was like, oh, crap. I thought we were going to have a little discussion about this, maybe. I didn't think we were just going to go right back. But... I don't know if it's the same nurse or not, but there was a nurse right in my face as soon as I opened my eyes, and she said, what is your name? And I said, Rosemary. And she said, what year is it? And I said, 2018. Where are you? And I said, a crummy excuse for an ER. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but the fact is, uh, I had been gone for more than 10 minutes. And there's always wow. the question, at what point do you stop trying to resuscitate somebody? 
And the medical belief is that after five to six minutes without oxygen to the brain, uh, the brain will start dying off very quickly. And the other interesting thing, because I did interview some medical personnel to write my book, and the other interesting thing I learned is when somebody dies of bleeding to death, you can't do CPR. Because as you pound on their chest or you do chest compressions, you're just pushing more blood out. Hmm. And as an ER doctor told me, he was very gracious to let me interview him, but as he said, when you have somebody that dies, I mean, what happens is your heart stops. The heart's a pump. And when it runs out of fluid, you're out. But he said, plug the leak, refill the tank, and restart the heart. That's the order in which they bring you back, which I thought was pretty interesting. So I was gone for more than 10 minutes. And you know, according to medical ideas, I should have been pretty compromised. Uh, I don't think I am. <laughs> I have trouble remembering <laughs> stuff sometimes. But the other thing that happened, and it took some time. I was in the hospital for a handful of days. <clears throat> but the other thing that happened is uh, I went back to my oncologist and I said, good news. I was healed in heaven. We don't have to worry about that chemo. We don't have to worry about those radiation treatments. I'm all set. Nice knowing you. <laughs> and uh, he wrote uh, mentally ill on my chart. They do these patient portal things now. So you can go online and see what they're writing about you. And I did. <laughs> he said, mentally ill. <laughs> That's it, mentally so that's ill. That was all society, he had to say. Yeah, well, he said some other stuff. And to his credit, he and his office called me repeatedly for the next few weeks and urged me to begin the chemo and radiation and said, you're going to die a terrible death. You know, the whole we caught it early thing. And so I had to go, I had to find another oncologist in another part of the state because <laughs> nobody wanted to go against this this one doctor and say, yeah, we'll take you as a patient. We'll just forget about that guy. So I did go to another doctor, and, uh, and there was a second surgery to make sure, you know, but she was very good. And anyway, she was, uh, she was a remarkable doctor, and she took a lot of flesh from a lot of places. She said she had to be sure. But she actually uh, greeted my friend, who was again in the waiting room, waiting for me to come out of surgery. She, this doctor who did the second bio surgical biopsy, he said she trotted up to him pretty quickly, threw her arms around his neck and said, she's right. There's not one cell of cancer left. Not one cell. She said, in fact, her, what she said was her flesh is so pink and pretty and perfect. I wouldn't believe she ever had cancer unless I'd seen the test in the first place. So mm. that was pretty cool. So, you know, a lot of people say I get all the same questions. A lot of people say, well, one, how do we know you're not making this up? My experience was so non-traditional. I didn't get a tunnel. I didn't get a field of wildflowers. I didn't see loved ones. I didn't get any of the normal things that people get. And secondly, they say, how do you know it wasn't a hallucination? And the way I know is because when I died, I was a mess. When I came back, I came back different. In fact, and this is an aside, I don't know if I've ever shared this in a podcast before, but at the time of my death, I had glaucoma, and I had already lost 15% of my optic nerve. Well, it took about a year before I actually went back to a doctor, but he said, you don't have glaucoma, and your optic wow. nerve is that of a young person. So a lot of things happened in that experience, and there's, there's a lot more. But the big healing, the real healing for me was I felt like I was given a reset over my husband's messy ending. I forgave myself. I forgave him. I forgave the people who deserted me, the people who just disappeared. I was able to just really forgive everyone, but mainly myself. I had been so hard on myself. I felt like I didn't deserve to live. I just felt so terrible. And something the angels told me was that all of the ugliness and the mess and the difficulty of his death had been encapsulated. And it couldn't hurt me anymore. And it wouldn't hurt me again. And that was so immensely comforting because my background is actually in architectural history. And when you're removing a contaminant from a historic structure or a building of any kind, really, sometimes it's better to encapsulate it rather than try to pull it out. Because sometimes in the removal of a contaminant, you end up dispersing more of it into the air than if you just left it undisturbed and had encapsulated it. So that's what the angels told me was this whole difficult and horrific experience had been encapsulated and 
it couldn't hurt me. And that was huge. And as the days went on and on, I forgave myself more and more because I had been in the habit of hating myself. I'd been in the habit of being angry at him and hating myself. And even just breaking that habit when I'd say, how could I be so stupid? I thought he loved me. And I would stop and I'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not going to say that anymore. You loved him. You loved. And that's okay. It certainly didn't go the way you wanted, but this life is so temporary. And I think one of the reasons, you know, we're, we're at 70 to 80 years before we get to leave this place, as my friend calls it, the uh, ball-shaped insane asylums, I think it's because <laughs> we get a reset. You know, life is hard. And I, I don't, I, as I recall, you've heard my story before, but one of the things that happened when I was in that hospital bed waiting to, to recover was when my friends would leave, because, you know, it's good to have friends with you when you're in a hospital, make sure they don't, you know, wheel you away for a kidney transplant or something. And my friends were with me, and when my friends would step away to go get a bite to eat or to go do something, the angels would surround my bedside, and they would sing to me, and they sang me the most beautiful songs. And I, I told them, I said, look, I'm really good with houses, but melody and lyrics... I'm really, I don't think I'll be able to remember this. I don't want to forget a, a note or a word of what you're singing to me. And they said, this isn't for you to remember. This is for your peace. This is for your joy. This is for your healing. This is a thank you for agreeing to come back. And they said, we know that life on this earth is hard. So this is a gift for you. And I used to say, you know, we tend to say, oh, I'll remember something until my dying day. I know that I will remember that singing for eternity. It was so incredible. And sometimes I just heard a prayer. Somebody sent me, I get the most, sometimes I get really beautiful emails. Sometimes I get not so beautiful emails, yeah. but for the most part, they're really lovely. But somebody said when they're feeling very alone and very frightened, their prayer is for the angels. I don't know who's on duty, but I need some help right now. <laughs> And I think that's a very powerful prayer. And one of the things I learned through this experience is that um, we God doesn't just love us, but God really, really likes us. And we don't have to earn that love. God doesn't say, you know, when you stop being a weirdo and a freak, eh, we'll talk about love. No. You know, if I could sum up the whole experience of dying and going to heaven and all the et ceteras that have that occurred in that heavenly experience— it would be three words, which are, welcome home, dearie. I felt like I was with my tribe. I no longer felt like a, an outlier, like an oddball. I felt like I had found my tribe, and they were so grateful to see me again, so grateful that I made it safely back. So I'm really, some days more than others, I'm very fuzzy on what I'm doing here. Because <laughs> dying is hard. <laughs> It is a hard experience. <laughs> Was for me. So, and this has been five and a half years, pushing six years now since my NDE or my temporary death experience. And people seem to think I'm some sort of shaman or ascended master. I am not. I still cry the night before I go to the dentist. I still have arguments with people I love. I still, I still have issues. I still have occasional nightmares. But this, the horror of my husband's suicide was lifted off of me. And the, the sickness that came along with that was lifted off of me. And one of the things I was told when I came back from this, every now and then I'd be really, really frightened that, oh no, what if the disease comes back? But one of the things the angels told me that touched me so deeply was she said, these things don't fade that God's things, the things of God, don't fade away. They're always there. And I remember, I was, I was, I, you know, the first few months after I came back from this, I did have little panic attacks over, you know, what if, what if I get sick again? And I was passing this car wash, and the car wash said, clean, shine, and protect. And I, I heard a little angel voice say, that's what that's what we did for you. You were cleaned, you got shined and buffed, and now you're protected. And you know, one of the things I neglected to mention is I haven't I haven't been on a podcast in two months, two months or maybe three. Uh, when I was in that white room and walking through the room and getting to that door, there was this this uh, this fog or this mist was actually swirling around me 
actively swirling around me. And I had asked the angelic being that accompanied me, I said, what? I, I feel like I ought to be able to focus on an individual droplet of this mist, which next time you're in a fog, think about focusing on an individual droplet. It's kind of nuts. But what the angel told me was, um, those are particles of light and your eyes haven't acclimated to this experience yet. But what you're seeing are particles of light. And it was likened to a spiritual car wash that I was being oh. clean. <laughs> and all the muck of the earth was washed away. And I was told that when we go to heaven, some people die with such a disease process imprinted on their soul that that muck of earth, and that was the word that was used, was the muck of earth has to be washed away. And I, I've... I liken it to a spiritual car wash. And I try to do that every morning. I try to do my spiritual car wash every morning, but some mornings I'm like, yeah, we'll skip that today. <laughs> so it was a big deal experience. And I'm, you know, people are like, well, you must have come back for a reason. I don't know. I got nothing. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> well, here's my experience of you coming back, telling your story, Rosemary, is that there was, I got to laugh and experience some joy and, I think there can never be too much joy in this world. So that's one thing. Well, that's a good you know. point. Yeah. That's a very um, good point. You, you mentioned uh, when you were floating in the, the sort of soft velvety void, you said the pre you said she about the presence. Did the, that presence have like a feminine aspect to it? Yeah. If anyone reads my book and they want to go to Amazon and write a review, Please don't write the review that says, God is not a woman. That's blasphemy. <laughs> because you know what? About a dozen people already beat you to that. <laughs> right. Okay. That's the number one email I get is God is not a she. God can't be a she. And yet, if you look up in the Bible, there's a lot of references to God in a maternal, motherly way. Yes, mm. it did feel to me like God was motherly. God was she. Using a feminine pronoun to describe God has really rattled a bunch of cages. I had somebody say, if you want your book to do, if you want your book to be a bestseller, get rid of this God, she business. But you know, when, when I was greeted in heaven and the answer was, you're the image and likeness, I'm the original. What do they think I'm going to see? Some, some, some big old man. I mean, give me a break. So yes, I do yeah. think of God as feminine. Well, I'm glad you kept it in. I haven't read your book, but. Now that you've said that, I'm glad that you kept it in because as uh, another one of my guests, uh, Jason Janice, really likes to go against tradition and, you know, what was written. And there's a lot of great things in the Bible and there's a lot of things that you could probably interpret in different ways as well. There was something else you mentioned about the angels who were singing to you. And I immediately thought of my friend Nikki Allen, who is a psychic, and she talks about the seraphim. Are you have you heard of them before? I'm. I know what seraphim is, but uh, I'm not familiar with uh, that specifically, yeah. as you mention it. No. Yeah, I, I can't say I'm hugely familiar with them, but I just that just reminded me of those. The seraphim are the healing angels, and they sing. The, the, the healing is done by their through their singing. Wow. That's just, well, that's interesting. I, you know, that singing business, uh, I've, I've done, I don't know, 60 or 70 podcasts. I don't know. I've done a bunch. But for a long time, when I would share this story, when I would get to the part about the angels singing, I would sob because it was such a profound experience. I just, I mean, I still see them. And a lot of people say, what do they look like? And what they were tall again, but they mm. were um, a human-esque form and they were wearing gowns of light. And when they sang, their gowns glowed brighter. Their songs were glorifying God. And as they sang, those, those gowns of light just got brighter and brighter and brighter. And I remember very specifically, late one night, my friends had left. The angels were by the bedside. A nurse walked in just to check on me or take my vitals or something. And uh, when she did that, um, I was so kind of spiritually hi, I guess, from the angels' voices, that that nurse turned to me and smiled. And it was a genuine smile. And I burst into tears because it was like she was looking at me with love. And I just felt so attuned to love, so tuned in to love that when she looked at me and smiled, I burst into tears and she said, what's wrong? What's the matter? And I said, 
your smile is so full of love. It's just, it's just kind of get, it's, it's getting to me in a good way. So I, you know, and I, I want to live in that place all the time. And I, I, maybe we're just not supposed to. I mean, how do you live in that place all the time when you have to deal with the IRS and the DMV and, you know, all the frustrations of life and you take your car in for an oil change and it takes three and a half hours? I don't know how you live in that high, holy place with the frustrations of everyday life. I really, I really wonder about that. Mm. I wish I could. There was a lot of people who have had an NDE but don't talk about it. I've had guests that have kept their mouth zipped for 20 years because they're worried about what people might say or they think they're crazy or they hallucinate it. And you, you mentioned a bit of this before. So for anyone who has not Absolutely. talked about their experience, what would you what would you say to them? Huh. <laughs> uh, I have people in my own family who are pretty, uh, what's the word? They discount the experience. And I used to be a reporter. I had a job as a reporter for a handful of years for a pretty big newspaper. And if I thought somebody was talking crazy, I would say, so what dates were you in the hospital? <laughs> what exactly happened? <laughs> what were your vitals before that happened? Who? What was the blood work like? I mean, I would ask questions. I remember <laughs> I was sent to interview a lady and I don't know, I can't even remember how this unfolded, but I was sent to interview. I think I think I was interviewing her because she was homeless. I can't remember the details. But I was sent to interview this dear old woman that had had a very hard life. And she, as I recall, she was living in a hotel with the largesse of the hotel owner. But she wanted to do the interview outside. So we're walking around in the outside and we were under some of those high tension wires. And she grabbed me. And she pulled me aside and she said, you need to stay away from those. That's how, I think it was, that's how the aliens uh, send their signals right to our brain. And I remember thinking, what do I say? Because I didn't want to discount her. You know, I didn't want to say, hey, you're just crazy. I wanted to be loving and say, well, you know, I think I'll be okay. I think I'm going to be okay, but let's let's move away from them if you're not comfortable and I wish the people who had doubts would ask me questions and just instead of just dismissing the whole thing, ask me questions, ask me what hospital I went to, ask me, ask me anything. <laughs> because one of the remarkable things about my experience is that when I died, I had cancer. When I came back, it was gone. When I died, I was lost in grief. When I came back, I was better. When I died, I just wanted I wanted to get away from earth and away from human beings. When I came back, I decided to write that book because I wanted to share the story. I, I did, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, not capricious, but kind of disregarding what this, the point of all this is. But after my husband's suicide, a friend of mine shared this comment with me that I wrote on a piece of paper and I put it all over my house. I mean, I literally taped this comment all over the house and it was, God, please help me heal so I can help others heal. And I think that's why I came back. I think that prayer's, mm. I hope that prayer's being answered, is help me heal so I can help other, others heal. And your question was, what would I say to people who don't want to share the story? I'd say, you know, just just listen to the angels. And sometimes I think you are better to keep it to yourself, but sometimes it helps people. I think it really helps people sometimes. And I can't tell you how many times I've run into somebody like I went into the hardware store and I had a brief exchange with a clerk and I can't remember what I told her, but I shared something pretty spiritually intimate and she got tears in her eyes and she said, you have no idea how much that helped me today. And I think, you know, I think that's what we're supposed to do. I just think we're supposed to be nice to each other and kind mm. and good as much as we can. You know, there's some people that won't let you be nice to them, but I just, I really think we're supposed to be nice to us, to people to the best of our ability. And sometimes that means sharing your NDE. And I guess other times we have to be protective of ourselves. If people are just after, I know, I know after this happened, I went and told everybody, told, can wait tell everybody everything about my NDE. And I met this one guy who I thought he was my friend. I told him about it. And boy, that guy spent the next 30 minutes explaining to me from a very intellectual point of view why I was wrong, why I was mm. completely wrong, and why I could not possibly be right. So I've become more circumspect about with whom I share. And I guess that's what we all have to do. Just be a little, have some wisdom. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. 
hard to do. Why is the serpent's harmless as doves? I've never heard that before. That's good. That's what Jesus uh, told us. Yeah. Uh, have you acquired any, or do, do you have any occurrences like, you know, angels revisiting, or have you had any other sort of extra sensory abilities that have stuck with you since you I wish here? I did. <laughs> I want to. <laughs> um, honestly, no more so than I had before. I, th I think I was pretty tuned into the spiritual, which is one of the reasons my husband's death was such a shock. You know, I remember one day, because he he worked at um he worked in city government, and one day he got dressed and you know he wore his ties and his suits and his you know he's a very dapper man, very handsome looking fellow, and he got all dressed up and he was heading. I gave him a, I made him breakfast and gave him a kiss goodbye and off he goes and he says I'm going to town and um, he walked out the door and I very clearly heard an angel voice say. Like it was the angel was standing right beside me, so it felt like. But the angel said, "Prepare yourself. The season of your life is coming to an end. He'll be dead soon." And I was like, "Wait, mm. what? What? No, no, no! That's something dark talking to me. That's not God." So I prayed extra hard, extra, extra, extra hard. But I heard that message again and again and again. I was like, "Stop! Stop it! That is not. That cannot be God's will for my life." Uh, so I, I think I've always been pretty sensitive to that stuff, but no, I don't have any ESP or, you know, anything like that. I, I do pray every day. I ask God, I used to pray when my children would go off to school every morning and I'd say, God, help them realize their full potential. And I kind of pray that for myself these days. Help me realize my full potential. You know, whatever I'm supposed to do, keep me pointed in the right direction. I, that's really my, I, I, I even pray when I drive in my car. I say, God, keep me pointed in the right direction. And that means keep me from flipping over, keep me from hitting anybody, keep anybody from hitting me, keep me pointed in the right direction. But no, I don't think I have any special abilities. If I did, I, you know, I think I'd like to have some good stock tips. That'd be very helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> That'd take all the fun. No, out nothing of it. like that. When you look back at the the sort of the events, you know, from when your when your husband died and, and your illness, et cetera, and then what's occurred since then, does it seem like it was there's a lot the end point where you are now, can you sort of see the value in how that occurred or why that needed to happen and what the rest of us as humans may have missed out had Rosemary not gone through that? Oh man, that's a really deep question. I don't know. I know that human life is hard. And the people who say it isn't, I don't know what they're made of. I don't know. I don't know how they can say that, especially now that I get a lot of emails and I hear I, I am not able to respond honestly to most of the emails. I read them and I always try to send up a quick prayer asking God to watch over them. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful to read them. There's a lot of people been through some very hard stuff. And uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, if my story is helping people, that's great. I don't really know that. I just, I honestly, I guess I think being nice to our neighbors and being nice to the, the clerk at the grocery store, you know, maybe being nice to our husband when he snores. <laughs> uh, who was it? Oh, Mother Teresa. I love this quote. She said, maybe we do, maybe we can't do great big things to change the world, but we can do little things with great love. I think that's what we're supposed to do. I think we're supposed mm. to do lots of little things with great love. Mm. I think that's true. I, I had another guest. She had the life review, you know, her NDA and then not everybody has them, but in, it mm -hmm. wasn't the big things that she was showing. It was these small acts of kindness and showing love oh, to other wow. people, that was what she was reminded of. One thing I've started doing, because I, I do want to be a blessing. You know, I'm kind of here on borrowed time, you know. I'm kind of here on, on God's time because I'm supposed to be out of here, but I'm not. Once a week and sometimes two, three times a week, I try to send a little love note, a, a card, you know, an actual card or a letter, and just say, that thing you did for me over Christmas was very appreciated. And I'm, I'm so impressed with how gracious you are and how kind you are. And I'm grateful you're my friend. And I try to send those out just 
out to the world as often as I can, just because we're supposed to be. I just, the world is a hard place. If we can show our neighbors and friends a little grace, I really think that's what we're called to do. Hmm. I'll do that too. So <laughs> what advice would you have for 25 year old Rosemary? Ah, <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Don't know. Okay. And how do you feel about the future of your life here on planet Earth now compared to before you're in the air? <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, I don't know. When I get overwhelmed by life, which I am way too sensitive, when I get overwhelmed by life, I remind myself that this is all very temporary. And one of the thoughts I had when I was you know, floating away from my body, one of the very profound thoughts I had was, you know... That 59 years sure went by in a hurry. You know, it just seemed like it was over like that. You know, and, and, and it really was like awakening from a very intense dream. And I tell myself when I get really wrapped up around the axle, you know, <laughs> worried about stupid stuff or even what seems like non-stupid stuff, I try very hard to remind myself that one day I'm going to look back and say, yep, that was all over in a hurry. <laughs> But yeah, this, this experience, some people just, you know, human misery is not doled out in equal measure. I wish, I really wanted to have the life where I met a guy, married a guy, and stayed with a guy for 57 years. I really wanted that. I thought I wanted that. And now I, I don't know. It, it didn't happen. It's not going to happen. So I don't know. I guess we just make the best of what we get. And I'm very grateful to be healthy. I promised myself when I was in the middle of all this horror of, you know, the grief, the guilt, the cancer diagnosis, all the stuff, that if somehow in the future it was behind me, that I would always be grateful that I'd been healed, always be grateful that it was in my past and it couldn't hurt me anymore. And I need, I need to tell future Rosemary that every day. <laughs> Just be grateful. Everything doesn't, everything doesn't go perfect every day. <laughs> yeah, so just remember what you said about that. Yeah. So if if people want to get in touch with you, Rosemary, I know you you said before you get people emailing you. Um, what's the best way for them to do that? Assuming that that's possible, and tell us about what you've got going on. Tell us about your book as well. Uh, my website is temporarydeath.com dot com, and there's a contact Rose tab on it, and my book is Remembering the Light: How Dying Saved My Life. Took me three years to write. I wrote it throughout the first manuscript, wrote it again throughout the second manuscript, wrote it a third time, and pretty much rewrote most of that. So it was a pretty intense labor of love. Wow. But yeah, it's it's up at Amazon. It's in Kindle. It's in a, a paperback. But it's going to be out as an audio recording pretty soon. I've done the recording, and now they're just tidying it up. So it will be available as an audio recording probably within a, less than a month. Well, uh, it's been my great pleasure to have you on the show today, Rosemary. Do you have anything that you want to leave people with before we wrap things up? No, just I guess kind of what I started with. If if you know somebody who's lost a loved one to suicide, understand that uh, actually the American Psychological Association came out with a comment years ago that said losing a close loved one to suicide is one of the most severe traumas a human being can know. So if you know somebody who's been through that, just be very patient with them. Be very present for them. As the, uh, as the people say, show up and help them. Show up and shut up. They're not there to listen to your own sad story. They're there because they're so alone. You know, as I said before, the people who've been through trauma and survived it are 21st century lepers. And that shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that way. Hmm. Rosemary, thank you for being here. Thank you for your grace and your humor and for being my <laughs> guest you. today. Thank you very much.